Greetings, urban farmers, gardeners, and healthy food visionaries. Greg Peterson here, and welcome to the 320th episode of the Urban Farm Podcast, where every day we work together educating and inspiring you to become part of your food revolution. Healthy food is something that everybody wants. Delicious and nutritious and right outside your door is even better. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or visit IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about our seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. Today on our podcast, we have someone who documents the history of the seeds she finds. We're talking with returning guest Shannon McCabe about heirloom seed stories. Shannon is a writer who found her passion melded beautifully with farming and growing heirloom vegetables when she landed the perfect job as farm manager and catalog writer at Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company. She has traveled the world as a seed explorer for Baker Creek, from cycling the tulip fields in the Netherlands in search of rare bulbs, to the remote jungle markets of the Peruvian Amazon in search of rare fruit. Shannon also co-writes the award-winning Whole Seed Catalog and dreamt up the Baker Creek Children's Gardening Book. She has enjoyed bringing the arcane heirloom vegetables of our past back to the forefront of the gardening discussion. Shannon strives to make growing heirloom varieties approachable to every gardener, from the children who read her kids' books to the large-scale organic farmers reading her variety descriptions in the catalog. Welcome back to the show today, Shannon. Are you ready to rock? Yes, I am. Excellent. Shannon joined us on episode 314 and shared her heirloom seed passion. Today, she is going to tell us all about Baker Creek Heirloom Seed Company. So what is Baker Creek, Shannon? Baker Creek is my passion. It's the company that I work for. We're an heirloom seed company. So we specialize in selling rare and unusual or just culturally beloved Heirloom seeds, those are seeds with a story, open pollinated seeds that can be reliably saved year after year. So our company, we have over 1,800 varieties, 1,800 unique varieties. Wow. Yeah, it's astounding, really. Sometimes folks ask me about a variety and I have to say, oh, oh yeah, that one, because we have so many. And they all have a unique and incredible story that really puts the variety in a place, a, t- a certain time and place or culture. It's it's a really a fantastic catalog of different varieties. So we have an award-winning catalog called the Whole Seed Catalog, and that is our expanded catalog. We offer a free catalog that has all 1800 varieties available, but then we have this expanded whole seed catalog and it's sort of a play on the whole earth book. I think it was called. Oh yes. It was a little before my time, but anyhow, the whole seed catalog is, it's kind of a coffee table book. It's full of recipes, articles, growing guides, and what's going on in GMO news. And it's this, this coffee table book. It's a huge piece of cultural information and as well as a seed catalog and that has won awards for it's it's very artfully designed and the descriptions are more lengthy and creative i guess than the average you know standard seed catalog so it's kind of a seed catalog on steroids and it's sort of our hallmark an heirloom seed company that is really dedicated to the seed story how cool is that so when and where do i get mine ah so we have a website called rareseeds.com And we have a free catalog tab that you can click on. You could just sign up for your free catalog to be sent each year. Alternatively, you can go under the shop tab and purchase the whole seed catalog. And that is just $9 and it's 300, I believe it's 365 pages. Wow. Beautiful photos, high quality photos, recipes, a growing guide, stories, absolutely chock full of information. And it's something you could keep over the years. Mm-hmm. It's not a catalog that would become outdated because it's got information that lasts. How cool is that? And you put it out once a year. Yep. It ships about late November, early December, you know, just in time for folks to start garden dreaming. The inspiration for the whole seed catalog is that we as gardeners know 
that the winter time is the time when you're dreaming and it's it's the most exciting time for designing your garden. You've got nothing but time to plan your garden. We really dive deep into descriptions so to really help folks find the perfect variety for them, something that either you know excites them with a story or is perfectly suited to their location or environment or or their culinary aspirations. So we really just try to hone in and play to people's garden dreaming in the winter, their winter garden dreaming. Nice. And how did you get involved with Baker Creek? Well, I studied horticulture in college and I worked on various farms. I did my own farming project on a historic piece of land on the island that I grew up on. I grew up on a small three by seven mile island off the coast of Rhode Island called Block Island. I had been farming out there. I was a customer of Baker Creeks and a huge fan. I used to get the catalog and I was obsessed as I found a lot of people get pretty, pretty excited about our catalog because it's, it's just so enthralling with the photos and the stories. I was really captured by the catalog and I was a market farmer and I wanted new or interesting, unusual products that I could use to really bring people to my market stand. I really love communicating with my customers. And when I had this amazing story that I had read in the Baker Creek catalog that I could share with my customers, they really felt like we were getting a, they were getting a better connection to their food. And so I was able to sell my product that much better because I had so much background knowledge about the actual mm, variety that I was yeah. growing. And so reading the Baker Creek catalog about a certain variety, I could say, oh, this variety is fantastic for pickling. And it was actually, it's been grown for hundreds of years in this area. And you have so many bits and pieces of information to share with folks, it makes the product that much more special. Right. So tell us about your position because you've come a long way. And how long have you been with Baker Creek? As I had said, I was growing Baker Creek varieties after about two years of that. In 2014, I wrapped up my gardening season and I had seen, I was receiving the email notifications from Baker Creek because I'd buy, been buying seeds. And I saw a notification that said that they were hiring, but you had to move to Missouri. <laughs> and I thought, well, yeah, I, I'll pack it up and move to the Missouri Ozarks if I could ever get a job there. I highly doubt they'd take me. Much to my pleasant surprise, they emailed me back that day and were super interested in meeting me. So I flew out that week for an interview and I was packing my bags within about a month wow. and I moved out to the Missouri Ozarks and I lived out there for two years as the garden manager. I continue to work for them. I've actually moved back to Rhode Island and I'm now a remote worker and I continue to write the catalog and do blog posts, writing, catalog descriptions, and I always travel for Baker Creek finding new varieties. So the only difference is I'm no longer the garden manager as I had been for the two years I lived in Missouri. I was the garden manager. Uh -huh. So now instead of garden manager, I'm just a full-time writer. Nice. So you took your passion of storytelling and you've made it into your vocation. Yeah, absolutely. As I had said in the last in the last podcast, it was a roundabout way to become a writer. As a kid, I always said I wanted to be a writer. <laughs> I sort of lost the path that way, started horticulture, which I love so much. And then somehow in a roundabout way, I ended up becoming a writer anyway. So it was, I guess, bound to happen. Nice. So you talk about working for the Willy Wonka of seeds. Tell me about that. <laughs> Yeah, so Jared Gettle is the founder and the owner of Baker Creek. What I love about Baker Creek is it's a family owned and operated company. And you really do have that down home family feeling when you're working for the company. Jared's Jer's family are just so warm and they're just the most fantastic people and they're in and out, you know, constantly. They're very involved with the business. Their kids are avid gardeners. All of our varieties are Sasha and Malia approved. And that's, that's his daughter's names. Uh -huh. I call Jer the Willy Wonka of seeds. He's also been called the Indiana Jones of seeds, but I think of him as the Willy Wonka because he comes up with these just incredible <laughs> wild ideas. And so I, sometimes I think, oh my gosh, that is so wild. How will we do it? And then somehow it becomes a reality. So I don't know where that puts me. Does that make me an Oompa Loompa? I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> I really love working for the Willy Wonka of Seeds, and I do have a really good time making these wild aspirations a reality because it's a ton of fun. Yeah. So really, he's a what-if kind of guy. 
Yes, absolutely. Yep. I love playing with people like that. I'm, I'm a what if kind of guy. It's like, what if we did this or what if we did this and then we go do it? Yep. And he's a total what if kind of guy. He's got this fantastic greenhouse and pioneer village on site. And he's always adding these larger than life additions. I mean, his greenhouse is this massive, incredible, semi-tropical, lush oasis. And it has everything from jackfruit to dragon fruit. There's a water feature. I think he's planning wow. to put giant Amazon lily pads <laughs> in the greenhouse. And his pioneer village is just larger than life. The National Heirloom Expo is this it's just total eye candy. It's this event that we put on each year and mm -hmm. thousands of heirlooms on display. It's just a parade of the diversity and he's all about the colors. And I've always said that Jer really sees the garden as like a blank canvas and he's just, he just paints it up, you know, with his colors wow. and shapes and he, he very much sees the garden in that way, which I find very refreshing. Wow. So how long has Baker Creek been in business? So Jer started the business, and maybe this speaks to his childlike enthusiasm. He actually started the business when he was 17 from his parents' attic. He was just photocopying his little seed catalog from teenage years, and it sort of incrementally grew as, as the public awareness for heirlooms, the importance of heirloom seeds began to grow, as people really started to fall in love with his amazing descriptions and his great photography, his company just organically grew from there. So it's truly a grassroots company. He started in his parents' attic at age 17 and I believe 1998. And he's just grown incrementally ever since. I believe that the Y2K scare was a big turning point for the company as folks really started to mm -hmm think critically about seed stability and about the stability of our food system. Yeah. Many, many people, myself included, consider heirloom seeds to be the crux of the future of our seed, of our food supply. Yeah, I completely agree with that. In fact, I think that that is the case. Plus urban farming, growing our foods in the cities is the solution to, you know, our global food issues. Absolutely. Getting a garden and everyone should be gardening. Whatever capacity possible, it's everybody's right. It's absolutely, it's everyone's right. And it's the most liberating experience that you can partake in is, is growing your own food. We all deserve that level of independence and creativity. So when you think about the landscape of the what ifs that Jer has thrown you since you started working there, is there one that particularly stands out that moved you that maybe brought you to tears that was like, oh my God, that is so cool. Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many, I could go, I mean, I could go on for ever on how many funky, cool, interesting things I've gotten to do for Baker Creek. But one that really just kind of made me laugh was one day Jer called and said, hey, flights to Europe are like really cheap right now. So buy your flight now and then sort of build your itinerary around oh my Europe. Gosh. And so it was sort of like, hey, go to Europe because it's a great time to go right now. So last spring, I packed my bags. I went to Europe. I cycled the tulip fields in the Netherlands and I actually had a successful trip. Trip. I was looking for rare tulip breeders. Sometimes in America, we kind of get what we get as far as the diversity in, in bulbs. There's sort of a standard list and it doesn't generally venture into too many rare and unusual varieties. It can be sort of a small list. So we thought, let's go to Holland or in the Netherlands. Let's do the cycling tour. We'll take photos and videos. People get really excited about that kind of stuff on the Baker Creek Facebook page and the website. Of course, it's so vibrant. And when it's in full bloom, I managed to successfully track down this incredibly unique bulb seed. I, I, I would call him, I guess, a bulb seed saver. Or he's a grower. Mm -hmm. And he's actually, he's traveled the world finding rare and strange bulbs. He's mostly his traveling has been in the wild, the wild native range of tulips. And so he, I believe he went deep into, I think it was Kazakhstan. Wow. It, I believe it was Kazakhstan on horseback. And he had said, he, this gentleman said he'd never been on a horse before. <laughs> and he took this, I think it was this long, you know, intense trek. And I think that was in the 1980s. And uh, he found wild tulips, which were he said were lightly scented. And I actually got to tour his 
tulip fields. And when you're in the, the Netherlands tulip fields, one of the striking things about the fields is that they're very one color block. You know, you'll get like an, a huge, a massive sea of red tulips. When I cycled upon this man's field, I was blown away because he had this patchwork of different colors and shapes and sizes. And indeed, he's been curating thousands of varieties of unique tulips, daffodils, and hyacinth. So I was able to catch him right at the peak of his bloom season. Oh my. He walked me through a catalog of blooms that were astounding from the world's oldest tulip variety to a lightly scented tulip to just the most zany, unbelievable colors and shapes. I was delighted. It was it was a feast for the eyes. It was a once in a lifetime experience and it was kind of just a hunch. I sort of found it by accident. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, and so in the coming years, we will be offering these much more exotic and wild kind of varieties than your standard bulb fair that's usually available. So I'm super looking forward to that. And it was, you know, we only sort of made this connection because Jer said, hey, there's an inexpensive flight to Europe right now. Why don't you get, <laughs> don't you get on a plane and check it out? So we had some success. Nice. Would you, did you go on your own or did he send a crew with you? He sent me with my esteemed photographer slash cousin, Letty Hansen. <laughs> so I took my cousin and she was a phenomenal photographer. She and I had a great time. And so, yeah, I talk about a once in a lifetime experience. My cousin's like my best friend. So I got to travel with, you know, one of the cl people who's closest to me. And we had just a phenomenal time. Beautiful. So Let's talk about heirlooms for urban farmers. This is the Urban Farm Podcast, so you have made up a list for us, I believe. Yes. It's not so much a list of varieties as it is general traits to look for when you're selecting your urban farm varieties. And let me just preface this with letting all of you prospective urban farmers and gardeners know that if you ever want a comprehensive list of varieties that would perform well in your area, whether you want to send me an email saying, Shannon, can you send me a list of good urban farming crops or urban farming varieties? Or can you send me a list of good crops that'll grow really well in Atlanta or Milwaukee? I'm always available for answering questions like that at my email, which is seeds at rareseeds.com, attention horticulture or attention Shannon. That's one of the main parts of my job as I work from home is answering folks horticulture questions, including what will grow best in my area. I do have a little list of traits to look for for your urban farm. So one thing that I like to drive home is maybe think about what the goal is for your farm or garden. And a lot of what I've found with urban farms is that they are teaching farms or a way to get the community involved. And so the big factor you want to remember when you're growing to teach or you're growing to demonstrate or you're growing just to get the community involved, always try to grab, to get some attention grabbing crops. So much like the crops I was describing that I like to choose for my customers to sort of get them to see, right? you know, get them to walk over to my stand as I was a farmer. I put that same thought in when I'm, when I'm thinking about urban farming crops. So say you've got a group of kids and you want to introduce them to the beauty of gardening. Nothing says as exciting like pulling a purple carrot out of the ground. Oh my gosh, no kidding. It's not an urban farming situation, but I had a bunch of children from a local Ozarks area come visit our farm at Baker Creek one day, and I will never forget their faces when I pulled a cosmic purple carrot out of the ground. They were astounded, and these were country kids, you know, who even do have a garden. Purple carrots, I can't say enough, they are a showstopper. So we have a variety called Black Nebula, which is a super dark purple carrot, and that's a new variety for us. Mm -hmm. And then we have the tried and true cosmic purple. It's a little bit more of a popular variety. It's really been well refined. So it grows well in most locations. I can't recommend it enough. I love the cosmic purple variety. I think carrots are a great one if you have the right soil. You want to have deep, well-worked soil because, you know, they will fork or get hairy if they're in, you know, rocky soil. But the beauty of urban gardening is a lot of times you're using potting mix or you're making mm -hmm. your own compost. You're not directly growing in ground. So oftentimes carrots are one of your best choices because you, you don't have that issue of compacted soil like you might if you're driving a tractor over your garden. So go for the colorful carrots. Grow a rainbow of carrots. Nothing, I mean, there's nothing more fantastic than growing the carrots. And then another factor that you want to consider, maybe you're not community gardening or gardening for education. Maybe you're gardening for, on your doorstep or in your windowsill or on your fire escape. 
if you're just container gardening and you need a compact variety, we do have a nice selection of dwarf varieties. And those are the best ones that you're going to want to consider is just those compact varieties. So things like the mini bell tomato or the white currant tomato. The white currant tomato has this really unique, super sugary, sweet flavor and these tiny little fruits. And the, the plant is almost self-supporting and it's very bush-like. It's not super small, but it's it doesn't crawl all over the place. It's sort of bushy and stands on its own. So I love the white currant tomato. The mini bell tomato is truly very small. So that's great if you really are gardening in a tight area. Mm -hmm. And then of course, always have to make a plug for the Mexican sour gherkins, also known as mouse melons or cucamelons. And those are a cucumber relative that are like a very small watermelon. Uh -huh. They look like a very small watermelon, but it's, you know, the size of a quarter. Really small. They're really small. And they taste like a cucumber. They're nothing like a watermelon. They're much more like a cucumber. They're great pickled. They're great eaten fresh. Kids are obsessed with them. I actually made a kid's, I made a Mexican sour gherkin teepee in my garden this year. And the cool thing thing about that crop is that it has this really ornamental foliage. It's got ivy-shaped leaves and it grows a very thick foliage. So it covers things. So say you have something kind of unsightly that you want to cover or you have a trellis or something that you can let the plant grow up. Mm -hmm. It kind of neatly grows up in the most beautiful way. It looks like climbing ivy and on top of it, you get delicious edibles and kids are obsessed with them. So Mexican sour gherkins, colorful carrots, and of course, the compact varieties. Those yeah. are my top choices for urban farming. Perfect. And really what you're doing is you're pulling specialty crops. You're making specialty plants, growing specialty plants that get people attention. And then you're learning the stories so you can share the stories at the same time. Absolutely. I also really like to study the, the histories of my varieties. And sometimes I find crops, they were bred maybe a couple hundred years ago, but they were bred specifically with the intention of being grown on a small intensive farm. I will totally butcher the name because I don't speak French, but we have a variety, Albu Vert or something like that, mm -hmm. A-U-B-E-R-V-I-L-L-E-R-S, -E <laughs> and it's a cabbage, and it was specifically bred for small-scale farming and for growing close to one another for tight-packed mm -hmm. planting, and uh, so it's high-yielding, but it can be grown in a compact manner, and so it's really nice that I'm able to take the time to really dive into the history of each variety and say, who was the person or people that selected this variety and what were they selecting for? And often when I do that research, I find out, oh, this is the perfect, you know, that's how I decided right. that that was a perfect urban farming cabbage. I said, oh, look, it was actually developed in the 1800s in France, just outside of Paris as the perfect market gardening cabbage to be grown in compact areas. So we learn a lot from the history and we can apply it to urban farming today. Beautiful. So you mentioned your annual seed expo a little earlier. Tell me about that because it's a spectacular event from what I hear. Oh my gosh. It is the premier heirloom gardening event. It is awe-inspiring. We display and allow people to in invite people to interact with thousands of heirlooms. We're pretty famous for our squash tower and our squash displays. So we grow, we actually, we go out to California in the spring and we plant up these fields of unique heirloom squash, watermelons, melons, tomatoes, and eggplants and peppers. And we grow all these varieties that we like to display at the expo. So if you like the heirloom varieties and you're fascinated by the catalog, please make the pilgrimage to the National Heirloom Expo where you can actually see these varieties in the flesh. Oftentimes you're invited to taste them and you can even, you know, sometimes buy them, most, most times buy them. We also invite tons of speakers on every topic. This year I spoke on flower farming. I am on the side, I actually am a flower farmer. So so I spoke on flower farming and turning that into a business and flower arranging. We had Dr. Vandana Shiva this year. She was speaking about seed sovereignty and the issue of GMOs mm -hmm. in the food system. We had Robert F. Kennedy Jr. That's uh, Robert Kennedy's son. And he was also speaking about the food system. We have Rachel Parent, who's this really super inspirational Canadian teen 
activist. Mm -hmm. So we have lots of great speakers, lots of great speakers. We have this incredible menagerie of heirloom seeds, and it's just a come a meeting of the minds, a coming together of all, all of these vendors and exhibitors. And so if you have any kind of passion for heirloom seeds, the stories, the taste, the culinary side, we pretty much explore every direction of that. And it's held at the Sonoma County Fairgrounds in Santa Rosa, California. We will be holding it this year. We we want to continue to, you know, in the light of their tragic fires that we've had and our hearts totally go out to them in the mm -hmm. in Santa Rosa for that because that is our that's our California family. Yeah. We've been doing this for years and our hearts really go out to the to the people in Santa Rosa and to those farmers and the people living there. So we're going to hold the the event this year in Santa Rosa as well. And we're looking forward to, you know, breathing a bit of life into their farming economy in the light of this in, of this fire. So. so that'll be September 2018. Yep. I believe it's the first oh it's the first yeah, it's the first week of September. Perfect. So Baker Creek gives a lot of giving back. Tell me about that and your seed donation program. Yeah, so we have a robust seed donation program, and it sort of really speaks to our whole mission. I mean, obviously, we're an heirloom seed company, but we love to sell heirlooms because we like that people can save the seeds year after year, and it's a very sustainable thing for people to invest in. And we we like that people buy seeds each year, but we really are more interested in, in folks buying something and then saving the seeds and passing them along. We hope to really breathe life into the seed saving, into the seed saving culture of America. Mm -hmm. And so with our donation program, that is our overall goal is just to get as many people gardening and seed saving as possible. So if you are a not-for-profit or a homeschool group or a school group, school garden, community garden, please reach out to us to our seed donation program. You can send an email at seeds at rareseeds.com. Attention donations. We have this lovely Christina Janes, and she is in charge of the donations program, and she is absolutely delighted to hear all of the stories. We always like to share the stories of the folks who we are donating to. That's our marketing is actually just, we like to give away seeds. We like to help get more heirloom seeds into more people's hands. Awesome. And you wrote a children's seed book. Tell me about that. Yeah. So that's something else that I hope folks will reach out to us and get as a donation because it's something else that we, you know, we, we do offer it. We sell the kids book, um, the children's gardening book on our website, but we also really aim to get it into the hands of as many kids as possible. So we do give it away as a donation item. So if you'd like the kids, kids gardening book, be sure and send an email to seeds at rareseeds.com attention donation, and we'll send you some kids books for your program. Anyways, just going back, the children's gardening book that I wrote is called Amazing Seeds. I guess I'll pull the copy that I have out right in front of me here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Amazing Seeds, A Kid's Guide to Strange and Wonderful Garden Veggies. And I wrote it along with the gardening staff at Baker Creek. We already kind of have a childlike wonderment in our, uh, you know, our catalog for gardeners. Uh, yeah, hello, Willy Wonka. Yeah, exactly. So we thought, let's bring that right down to kids. So we have kids gardening projects. I talk about the three sisters garden, the three sisters garden and the history of that tale and how kids can grow their own three sisters garden. I talk about the importance of growing heirlooms. I talk about growing organic, but I keep it really fun and light for kids. So I've got little stories. I've got a few heirloom stories. I talk about some heirloom explorers, lots of cartoons in the kids book, and it's broken down by variety. So I have a tomato section and a pepper where, you know, my pepper section, I have a cartoon depiction of the Scoville scale. And I explain what is the Scoville scale and how it works. What is it? Oh, what is the Scoville scale? So the Scoville scale is basically the hot, the heat the heat rating of a pepper. Ah. So for example, a bell pepper is a zero and the Trinidad Maruga scorpion is about a 500,000. <laughs> and, and a Serrano pepper is about a 10,000. A jalapeno is about 3,500. So I talked, it's a really cute little illustrated cartoon and I have to make a shout out to Aretha Mayhan. She is an awesome artist. And I have to say it was one of the most tickling 
experience of my life was to get to make a little list of cartoons that I needed drawn up for this kid's book. So I said, hey, I need a cartoon of Elvis crooning into a pickle microphone because Elvis was a huge fan of fried pickles. I just had so many strange cartoons that I had written up for the catalog uh-huh. that we put in there. So I, I need a picture of a mummy holding a boiling pot of beans. So we had a really good time with the cartoons. It really brought it down to a level where kids could understand it and yeah. get into it. And so, yeah, don't forget, if you're interested in getting a copy of that kid's book, if you want to buy one, they're on our website under the shop tab, or you can get one donated or get them donated to your class, your homeschool group, or your not-for-profit project or what have you. We love to get this in the hands of as many kids as possible. Beautiful. And I'll also note that while it is written for kids, I'm constantly getting admissions of guilt from adults saying that they steal their kid's book and read it for themselves because it is <laughs> chock full of good information and kids, adults like it too. Yeah, exactly. So any last thoughts before we uh, move on? I just, I guess I just really wanted to drive home the importance of sharing those stories. And I guess in my job on a very regular basis, I'm faced with folks who are reaching out to Baker Creek to give us their, to entrust their family heirlooms to us because their family interest has dropped off or there's, you know, the, the matriarch or patriarch of the family has passed away or has forgotten the story. And so just continue to write those stories down or save those stories and encourage folks to, to save their stories because I think one of the most striking things about my job as a seeds, you know, storyteller and as a researcher is that there are a lot of stories that are lost and that mm-hmm. as our food system con- becomes increasingly more industrialized and we focus on monoculture, the diversity is in peril. So it is our job to save those stories, pass down those stories and, and those seeds. And the seeds too. Mm-hmm. And the seeds too. So in your sharing, you you planted another seed for me of a question to ask you. If I, as a listener, have a seed that is just really cool, how do I get it plugged in with you guys? Ah, yes. So, and I, I love the various forms of seed donations that we get. We have a seed bank at Baker Creek. We built our own seed bank. So it's very, you know, your variety will be in very good hands when it comes to us. We catalog everything that we get. We have it in a database and we keep it in our seed bank. And the range of ways that we get our seeds sent to us is like just hilarious. I mean, from from older folks who send handwritten letters of, you know, funny anecdotes or stories to emails. And we get just about every kind of funny letter in between and just correspondence. So we we save those stories. We have a library where we save our stories. So we save our stories. We save the seeds themselves. And uh, the best way to send them to us is to send an email or a letter to Baker Creek. And if you send an email, you'll be sending it to seeds at rareseeds.com. Maybe attention Shannon or attention Martin. Martin works in our warehouse and he also receives, he receives seeds often more than I do. Or you can snail mail them to us. Our mailing address is Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds and it's 2278 Baker Creek Road. Mansfield, Missouri, 65704. Send us some snail mail. Send us a postcard with some seeds, Mm -hmm. however you want to send it. But we love hearing people's stories, no matter how mundane. I mean, sometimes they seem silly, but we love to have stories. Yeah. Yeah, they're not. Well, thank you so much for joining us again on the show, Shannon. Oh, thank you. It was my pleasure. Great stories. So how can our listeners get a hold of you? There's a few ways that that listeners can get a hold of me. You can either send me an email, seeds at rareseeds.com, attention Shannon in the subject line, or you can uh, follow me on Instagram. That's uh, my more personal handle, and that's Seed Scavenger. That's my personal Instagram where, you know, all of my gardening endeavors, whether Baker Creek related or not, is posted. And then if you have an interest in Baker Creek, I'm very involved with our Facebook page. So you can follow us on Facebook or send a message. And we're just Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds on Facebook. And the website is rareseeds.com. Perfect. You can find show notes from today's podcast at urbanfarm.org forward slash Baker Creek stories. 
as well as our previous episode number 314 with Shannon at urbanfarm.org forward slash Shannon. We are your urban farming resource. You can find our podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, and many other outlets. Also visit urbanfarm.org to find articles, podcasts, webinars, courses, and more. Well, that's it for today. Thanks for joining us on the Urban Farm Podcast. Healthy food is something that everybody wants. Delicious and nutritious and right outside your door is even better. Just text GARDEN to 44222 or visit IWantToGarden.com and you will receive our free webinar about our seven key factors you need to know to grow your own food. We hope you enjoyed today's episode of the Urban Farm Podcast. Remember to listen for tips, advice, and resources to help you on your journey with urban farming. You can find us on the web at urbanfarm.org or send us an email to podcast at urbanfarm.org. In the words of Vincent Van Gogh, great things are done by a series of small things brought together. Be encouraged that with each lesson learned and skill developed, you are one step closer in the direction of your dreams.